Okay, everybody, I think we should uh, get started. It's a couple of minutes past four. So I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Um, and especially I'd like to welcome our distinguished uh, speakers and panel. Um, and just cut, make a couple of introductory points about why we should be interested in industrial policy. Um, most economic theory uh, argues for a process of gradual uh, convergence between countries, with poor countries growing slowly, uh, more rich. But in the last decades, we've seen this with a somewhat of a difference. We've seen some countries converging very rapidly and transforming the structures of their economy, moving up the technological value chain. And we've seen some other countries lagging behind, often staying as mineral economies, uh, and lagging very badly. And I think that there's been a certain amount of frustration with uh, progress in some parts of the developing world, deservedly or undeservedly. Um, and some of this has been frustration with the market-based reforms that were introduced in these countries, uh, again, in response to often very disastrous performance of um, uh, heavily uh, interventionist policies before that. So we've had this kind of cycle of thinking. And now I think that um, despite the misgivings of many economists, we have seen some experimentation, countries moving back towards uh, trying to find more active ways to accelerate growth and transformation. And we've seen this uh, in the US. Uh, you know, uh, you have green energy. You have recently the emphasis on manufacturing. You see it in Brazil with the um, bigger Brazil plan, which emphasizes certain branches of industry, manufacturing. Uh, and it raises a question uh, as to whether the advocates of the new industrial policy have really got it right this time. And um, from that, there's another question that I think is in, of interest here, which is, you know, what kind of advice, policy advice, should the IFIs and bilateral development partners be giving to the countries they work with? And what kinds of investments uh, should they be financing? So these are important questions. And I think uh, Justin's recent book, this one, I'm sure you've all bought copies, so uh, uh, this, this provides a very good opportunity to revisit these questions. Um, it includes contributors by quite a number of uh, others, ex including Justin. And I think the set of speakers we have is very well qualified to address these questions. Before introducing them and moving on, I think let's have a few ground rules. Um, We've asked the speakers to be reasonably concise to allow some time for engagement between them and also with the audience. And we know that there are some members of the press here with an interest in some other questions. So in particular, um, Justin's plans uh, when he leaves the World Bank, he will be leaving in uh, June. I must say it's been a great privilege to have worked with Justin during part of the time that he's been here. I've enjoyed that very much. Um, and uh, Justin has promised to make himself available uh, after the meeting to discuss that issue in more detail. And I imagine there may also be some questions relating to recent developments at the World Bank, which many of us are interested in. And uh, what I'd like is to ask you if you can hold discussion and views on that uh, in the general discussion until after we've dealt with the main topic. So, without more ado, let me introduce uh, Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and uh, invite her to make some introductory remarks. Um, Nancy, in your recent book with Frank Fukuyama, you posed a couple of questions about how we should think about development policy in the post-crisis world, and what challenge do you see for our speakers in this area? The podium is yours. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Justin, and congratulations on your book. I don't know if every chief economist at the World Bank manages to, to do a book during his tenure or her tenure. Um, and uh, my thanks now to us, our other speakers, Steve Radlett and Ann Krieger. It's really nice to see both of them back here. Uh, Ann is a member of our advisory group um, at the center, and Steve, as most of you I hope know, is a former senior fellow here. Um, we're holding this event, as Alan said, at a very key moment in uh, the life of the development economics community. 
and in the life of the World Bank, um, which is such a big player in that economics community. Um, uh, the World Bank Board announced today, as I'm sure you all know, uh, that it had selected Jim Kim, the U.S. nominee, to be the next president. This decision has direct bearing, in a way, on the topic of our discussion today. So with your forbearance, I'm going to just take a minute on the World Bank decision issue and then go to sort of answering the question that Alan posed to me very indirectly. Just a couple of points about the World Bank process. First, it was the selection process this time more open and competitive than ever before. And in that sense, it made history. But it still fell short. Um, we're in a kind of in-between situation. The old leadership, the traditional process for selecting the leadership, is gone. I think it has been laid to rest in a good way. But we don't yet have much clarity on the rules and procedures and arrangements that will take its place in the next round. And why, second, why does this matter? Um, it matters because it does matter who leads the World Bank and what vision he or she brings to the bank um, in a way that matters to the development economics community because the leader at the bank is uniquely positioned to shape the global discussion on development policy in a number of ways. First, by his appointments to the job, for example, of chief economist. So it's really wonderful to hear today from uh, the current chief economist. Second, by the priorities that the president sets in terms of big choices, big dilemmas, big trade-offs in how you proceed to do economic growth and development. And third, of course, by his views on, for example, the role of the state versus the role of the market and what that trade-off is about. It's very good to have someone uh, becoming the president of the World Bank who's clearly committed to the development project writ large and sees himself as a development person. Whether uh, Jim Kim will be able to bring his particular experience as an anthropologist and a physician about which he's spoken in terms of his vision for the bank uh, to the difficult choices he faces um, remains to be seen. Um, I hope someone will brief him later, maybe not today, tomorrow, next week, on today's discussion about Justin Lin's book and the various views people have on it, because it is a central question in development and in development economics. Um, I did want to say that a previous World Bank president, Jim Wolfenson, who, like Jim Kim, is a naturalized American, spoke at the launch of the Center for Global Development 10 years ago. At that time, he said something like, I know you will be keeping me on my toes with informed, thoughtful, and constructive criticism. I think we've tried to do that for the last 10 years, and I think today's session is the beginning of doing that for our next president. Now, I want to take us back to 1992, because John Page is speaking today. And John was um, the, um, the key lead person on uh, a book called The East Asian Miracle, which was produced uh, at the World Bank when I was there as uh, the director of the develop, what was it called, the Policy Research <laughs> Department. And the story behind the East Asian Miracle, actually, is that it was the Japanese, as John might want to remind us, I don't know, who were frustrated that the bank was taking such <coughs> a singular kind of view of what was of ideologically and politically what had to be done in terms of policy. And the Japanese were interested in having a careful, systematic, analytic assessment of the way growth happened in East Asia. So I'm hoping we hear something from John about that. Then I would say over the next two decades, um, the Washington Consensus, which was sort of peaking in the early 90s in terms of um, its influence on certainly the World Bank and, and the IMF's views of what to do and how countries should proceed to cope with their challenges. It gradually yielded over the last two decades in various ways 
to the sort of new non consensus that's captured in the spence commission report which says well it depends pretty much each country has to find its own way there are certain principles that matter but how countries proceed on those principles is very much up to them and then of course we had the global financial crisis we're still in the midst of that in a way after three four five years it's just shifted from its center in the US and then the UK now to the Eurozone and um, it was just after the crisis in the spring of 2009 that I worked with Frank Fukuyama and several others at the center and elsewhere on this book on new ideas after the crisis and that's when I got interested again in what was it about the East Asian miracle that mattered. Uh, was it industrial policy in the narrow sense of the word or was it something else about the uh, way the state uh, directed, managed, worked along, helped, cooperated with the private sector? So that's not an answer to the question that Alan raised for me. But I wanted to take us back through time. This is a huge issue. What's interesting about the recent crisis, or at least 2008, 9, 10, is that it, in a sense, for developing countries, it knocked the US model in the extreme, say, cowboy co capitalism, or the free market <coughs> capitalist model, sort of off its pedestal. The developing countries continue to embrace, in many respects, that model with some exceptions. Uh, in a way, the US and the Europeans have always done something that we might call industrial policy. So let's hear from uh, those who've really studied this issue. I'm very much looking forward to it. I think we start with somebody introducing Justin. Alan's introducing Justin, good. A proper introduction, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, now, uh, let me introduce Justin Lin. All our speakers have very long uh, biographies, so uh, I'm going to keep them short uh, because I think you know a lot about them already. Justin, of course, is the chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank Group. Um, uh, and uh, prior to joining the bank, he spent 15 years. He was the founding director and professor of the China Center for Economic Research, which is the leading center for economic uh, analysis in China. He received a PhD from Chicago, and he's the author of 18 books so, uh, uh, on um, a range of topics. Um, in 2007, he gave the Marshall Lectures at Cambridge, and I think uh, some of the ideas in the book were very much uh, developments from that work. Um, it's been a great pl personal pleasure for me to work with Justin and to see how he's applied his thinking and his mind to all kinds of development issues. So without more ado, Justin, please. So how can I have this? How can I do this? Okay. Well, Nancy, Alan, and all of you, and I thank you very much for this opportunity. I remember four years ago, exactly in a spring meeting time, and I was offered the position to be the chief economist of the World Bank. But before I took that job, I need to pass one examination, and that was the Center for Global Development mm -hmm. organized a breakfast meetings and invite me to meet a whole group of you know, development economists, policy thinkers in Washington, D.C. And I raise all kinds of questions and to test whether I'm qualified. And I treat that as some kind of you know, uh, admission committee's interviews. And luckily, I think I passed that exam. And so, I went to be the chief economist of the World Bank. <laughs> now four years passed, and I treated this meeting like a PhD dissertation oral exam. <laughs> because now I try to present you my research, my thinking, my finding. 
in the past four years. And as Adam mentioned, that I will finish my job at World Bank on June the 1st. And uh, this is a very good opportunity for me to present my findings and to see whether I pass the exam again. And I'd like to you know, propose a rethinking, not only in the industrial policy. I'd like to propose a rethinking in development economics. And with a framework I call new structural economics. And how come we need to have a rethinking? Because as trained economists, I always treat the purpose of economic theories is to help us understand the causality, the reason behind the observed phenomenon. And the best that observation that we can design policy to improve the outcomes. And whenever economic theory cannot explain the phenomenon, well, policy based on the theory cannot achieve the intended goal. We need to have a rethinking. And use this criterion in effect. Development economics, as Nancy just reviewed, has always been in a process of rethinking. Because we know that development economics is a new field in modern economics. It did not appeal until the post-war period. At the beginning, the development economics was dominated by the so-called structuralism. Try to you know, collect the structural difference between a low-income country and a high-income country. At that time, the understanding of the reason for the low-income country cannot become a developed country was because of market failures. So they proposed to use government intervention <laughs> and adopt import substitution strategies to collect the economic structure. We know the result was miserable. And because of that, there was a rethinking to the so-called Washington Consensus. At that time, the understanding how come the low-income country cannot improve their performance was because of government failures. And the recommendation was a marketization, privatization, liberalization. I thought that in a structural piece. And we know the result was also disappointing. And during this period of time, certainly there are some countries, they were doing quite well. Internal development, like East Asian, you know, middle class Asian countries. And they adopted export promotion instead of import substitution, even from the recommendation of structuralism. And during the 1980s, 1990s, many countries started with the transition. And China, Vietnam, and earlier Mauritius, they also did very well. But they adopted a gradual, dual track approach instead of a structural piece. And we see that all these two groups of countries, they have something in common. They all, a market economy, were moving towards the market. And in the whole process, they have very proactive government. So they are different from the recommendation from the structuralism or the neo liberal Washington Consensus. Because of that, we need to have a rethinking. And I'd like to say World Bank, like Nancy mentioned, has to be in the process of rethinking first the publication of East Asia miracles. And that summarized the finding to be a successful country, you need to have an export orientation and market-friendly government. And then you have the 2004 publication of the lesson of the 1990s to examine the transition experiences. And the finding was there's no one side fit all. And the Washington consensus basically a one side policy. And then the newest one is the Growth Commission report. And they found that all the successful countries have five things in common. Openness, macro stability, high rate of saving and investment, market mechanism, and a committed, capable, proactive government. But I like to say, yes, World Bank is leading the readings. But so are mostly status effects without a framework. So as a result, if I go to an African country, and uh, if the government asks me how to improve my performance, if I told them there's no one size fit all, did I bring any useful information to them? And I like the Growth Commission report, Michael Spence always say, to be successful, there are ingredients, but no recipe. 
If there's no recipe, how can you cook the food, right? And so, because that, I want to continue the rethinking, and I propose the new structural economics. And what is the new structural economics? It's an application of the neoclassical approach to understand the nature and the causes of economic structure and its evolution. And why I want to focus on, focus on structure, because from what I see, economic development, my nature, is a process of continuous change in the structure of technology, industry, soap and hot infrastructure or institution, or telecommunication, all those kind of things. Then why I call it new structural economics? Because by convention in modern economics, if you apply neoclassic approach to study agriculture, you should call that agricultural economics. To study finance, you call that financial economics. But because of there was, and so I should call my approach as structural economics. But I need to call new because there was structuralism before me. And to distinguish myself, I use new structural economics. Just like in the 1960s, when Douglas North started to apply the neoclassic approach to study institution and its evolution, he should have called that an institutional economics. But because in the US, in the, before there was an institutional school, and to distinguish them, so he used new institutional economics. So that's in the same spirit. And uh, from what I see, my main hypothesis is that the economic structure is endogenous. Endogenous to what? Endogenous to the endowment structure, that is, capital, labor, natural resources that a country has. And those kind of endowments are given at any specific time and are changeable over time. And also we know that endowments is the total budget that a country can use at any given time. And the endowment has a structure, relative abundance of capital, labor, natural resources. And it determines the relative price of those kind of factors. Two economies, you know, two of the most important parameters in our analysis, in our toolbox, total budget, and the relative prices. Endowment and endowment structure determine that. And uh, we also know that endowment and structure determine the competitive advantage at any given time. And if a country or the industry are consistent with their competitive advantages, the economy should be most competitive. And uh, so industrial structure, the best on the competitive advantages, should be considered as the optimal industrial structure at a given time. Certainly, if a country want to be a high income country, advanced country, they should have the same income level as a high income country. But if you want to have the same high income level as a high income country, you need to have the same level of productivity as a high income country. By that, you need to have a similar level of technology and industries. But before you want to have this kind of high income country industrial structure, you need to improve your endowment structure because industrial structure is endogenous to the endowment structure. But in this process, you also need to improve the infrastructure, both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure like institution and so on. And uh, based on this simple framework, we can find for a country to achieve a dynamic, sustained, and inclusive growth. The best way is to develop their economy according to their competitive advantages. Because by that way, they will be most competitive. They can create the largest possible economic surplus. So they have more to say. At the same time, it can be proved the rate of return to investment will be the highest. So you have the most to say, and you will have the highest incentive to say. Capital can be accumulated very quickly. Endowment structure will be upgraded. Once endowment structure upgrade, then you can help the industrial upgrading. And this is the best way to achieve dynamic growth, poverty reduction, and so on. But the issue is that to follow a country's competitive advantages to develop your industry and technologies, it's a term only understandable to economists. And uh, if you want the private sector to follow that spontaneously, you need to translate the competitive advantage in kind, into some kind of relative prices signals, which reflect 
the relative abundance of your endowment structure. And the only way to have those kind of price signals is to have a competitive market. And that's the reason why all the successful countries, they are market-based. But if the market is so important, how come we still need to have a state there? It is because economic development is a process of continuous change in the structure of technology, of industry, of hard and soft infrastructure. And there's a lot of issues related to externalities, as well as a coordination. And without government proactive, you need that to a spontaneous process is going to be very, very slow. And so government can play some kind of proactive role in mm -hmm. order to overcome the challenges of externality and the coordination. And based on this simple framework, we can understand how come the structuralism failed. The main reason the structuralism failed was because they wanted to advise a developing country to develop a modern, advanced industries. They are very capital intensive, but they are poor agrarian economies. So those against their competitive advantages, firm in those kind of target sectors, were not viable in open competitive market. And the government need to use all kind of subsidy and protection through all kind of distortion in order to make that kind of strategy possible. And with that, they might be able to build up the modern industries, but they are very inefficient because misallocation of resources, separation of incentive, and those kind of protection create all kind of rate. So you're going to have a rent seeking, corruption, and also political capture. And this can also understand how come the Washington consensus with good intention, but also did not do well. Because all the country in a transition in a reform, they started with all kinds of distortions. And those kind of distortions created all kinds of non-viable firms. If you want to you know, remove all those distortions immediately, then all those non-viable firms will go bankrupt. You are going, going to create a huge unemployment issue, social political instabilities. Without social political instability, certainly you cannot have a dynamic economic growth. But for fear of that, in the effect, after the shock therapy, many countries reintroduce all kinds of subsidy and protection in an even more disguised way, and even less efficient way. That's one of the politicians. <coughs> and secondly, the Washington consensus did not provide the vehicle, the channel, or the study understanding about how to facilitate the new growth, the change, the industrial upgrading and diversification. And if you see how come the successful country, they all follow gradual dual track. On the one hand, continue to protect some kind of transitory support to the older sectors in order to prevent them go bankrupt to achieve stability. But at the same time, they also provide facilitation for the entry to the new sectors which are consistent with their competitive advantages, which can create a job and dynamism. And so they can achieve dynamic growth and a stability at the same time, and the dynamic growth will create a condition to further reform the oil sectors. And with this understanding, in this dynamic economic process, industrial policy is desirable. It's desirable for two reasons. Because the content of coordination will be different depends on what kind of industry you are going to develop. And also because the government resources are limited. If the government is, has unlimited capacity and, and resources, then you can provide all kinds of infrastructure, both hard and soft, for everything. However, the government capacity and resources are limited. So you need to prioritize. You need to treat, treat which one you want to develop first. And uh, to be successful, based on the new structural economics, you need to target sectors which are your latent competitive advantage. That means that your endowment structure changes. You know, based on factor cost of production, they should be your competitive advantages. But because of lack of coordination in the infrastructure and so on, they have not been competitive because their transaction costs have been so high. And the government role should be identify those kind of sectors, remove those kind of transaction costs related to the coordination issue. But the issue is how? And based on the new structural economics, I propose a two-track, six step. A two-track, the first step, track is to identify. The second track is to facilitate. And how to do that? Competitive advantage always means compare, right? Compare with yourself, compare with other people. So the way to do it is that, to look into 
countries, which currently their per capita income measured by purchasing power parity is around 100% higher than yours. They are growing dynamically in the past 20 years and look into their tradable sectors. Those kind of tradable sectors is most, are most likely to be your latent comparable advantages. The first, second step, coming home to see whether you have already some private sectors, already discovered that, enters. But currently, because of lack of coordination, they are not competitive. And, uh, and so remove those kind of constraints that they can turn into competitive because they have low wages. And uh, so what is that? Some of the sector might be new. But for those kind of dynamic growing country for 20 years, they are going to lose comparative advantage in those kind of sectors. They have the incentive to relocate. Why not invite them to come? And what are the barriers for them to come? And help remove those kind of barriers, make your country <laughs> attractive destination for their relocation. The first one certainly, technology is changing so fast. So some new sector, some new product, some new services which may not exist 20 years ago, but now opportunity come. And if you have private sectors which identify those opportunities and show the potential, the government should also help remove the mining contract for them to grow. So you can see this process is some kind of framework for the government to work with the private sectors in order to identify sectors which they are likely to be successful. And we know that in a developing country, especially low-income country, infrastructure both hard and soft in general are poor. Certainly, it would be desirable to improve everything for the whole country. But we know resources and capacity limited. So in that real part, export passage zone would be desirable. To focus on that areas and to make the, within the park, within the zone, the hard infrastructure good enough, soft infrastructure good enough, and it will also have the advantage of encouraging cluster to further reduce the transaction cost. And the last one, the economic development is a dynamic process. You always need to have the first movers. First mover creates externality for others. So you need to have some kind of compensation for that. But here, the compensation only need to be raised more because it's overcome externality instead of the viability issue. So like a tax holiday for a few years uh, and, and access to credit and so on, that would be enough. Lastly, I'd like to have two additional points. One is that you know, in the process, certainly for any country, they will move from agriculture to manufacturing to post-industrial stages. But for our low-income country, the structural changes in agriculture, both technological structure from the traditional technology to modern technology and move away from the stubble food to cash crop would also be very important because that is the way for low-income country, the quickest way for poverty reduction and you also provide the foundation for further diversification. And for the resources rich country, if you follow these strategies and to have a good management of their resources and also use the resources to facilitate the diversification, then resources will be a operation instead of curse. So let me conclude. I strongly believe every developing country has the potential to grow continuously at 8% or more for several decades and become a middle income or high income country in one or two generations. But there are some condition. Certainly, they need to have a government to have the right policy framework to facilitate the development of the private sectors along the lines of the country's competitive advantages so that they can be competitive and they can tap into the potential of late commercial advantages so they can have a much faster rate than the high income country. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, I'd like now to invite our panel to come up and uh, join us up here. While they're coming up, I'll uh, give you brief introductions to them. I know that uh, this particular panel doesn't need much introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, first of all, Ann Kruger, 
Um, Anne, welcome. Uh, Anne is the Professor of International Economics at Johns Hopkins, SAIS. Uh, she's also a senior fellow of the Center for International Development and the Harold and Caroline Richbrew Emeritus Professor of Staff Science and Humanities in the Economics Department at Stanford University. She was the first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, and uh, much more importantly, she was the Vice President of Economic Research, Chief Economist of the World Bank before that. Um, let me then move on to John. So welcome, Pam. John, John Page. John is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And he's also country director for Ethiopia and Tanzania and the International Growth Center Project, um, which is of the London School of Economics and Oxford University, where I think that project has been looking at some of these issues as well. He was previously at the World Bank, and uh, he was a regional chief economist for the Africa region and the MENA region, so he has double uh, sort of diligence there. And um, uh, he was, of course, the prime main author of the East Asian Miracle, as Nancy mentioned. Uh, so he actually produced a study which kind of got it right. Usually, you know, economists project something and it doesn't happen. Well, this particular one did, so. Congratulations, John. Uh, Steve Radlett. Well, yeah, well, I guess he's improved our generally poor forecasting record there. Uh, Steve Radlett. Steve, welcome back to CGD. Steve is the chief economist for USAID, and uh, he was previously the senior advisor for development for the Secretary of State. Uh, prior to that, and more importantly, he was a senior member of the Center for Global Development. We miss him very much. Uh, his work focused on growth, poverty reduction, foreign debt, aid, and trade. He was an economic advisor to the president of Liberia. And um, among other achievements, he wrote a very important book on Africa, on the economics of Africa. So let me, uh, let me stop there and uh, invite Anne to make the first intervention. Anne, um, are you still a skeptic? Um, what do you see in terms of possible benefits and main risks, and are there ways that we can minimize these? Uh, thank you, Alan. I guess that's just to stay here in the interest of time. Um, well, what do I think? Uh, am I a skeptic of the industrial policy part in the sense of targeting industries and so on? Yes, I'm very much a skeptic. I certainly agree that infrastructure is important. I certainly agree that governments need to be supportive uh, and to look for ways to strengthen markets competition to provide the infrastructure. Uh, my, my own judgment is that in most countries that I know anything about at least, uh, governments have not done what they should be doing, or anywhere nearly it, in things like education, uh, in uh, agricultural extension and research, in uh, health, and there are a number of things governments must do that really can't be done elsewhere, and I guess I think government has a comparative advantage in those. In addition, I think provision, of course, of uh, a, a commercial code, a legal framework, uh, that's the range of issues that go with good governance is just horribly important. Uh, and one of my concerns, but only one of them, about the industrial policy uh, suggestion, if that's what it is, is that that goes very much in the face, I think, of the kinds of uh, reforms that most of us think in many countries need doing. Uh, the very idea that you would reward some firms which did well gives enough jurisdiction, I think, to most bureaucrats uh, for them to line their pockets eminently. Uh, the, the suggestion that we will target certain industries has several problems. <clears throat> I think even if, even if a country, even if the United States had some correctly pinpointed in 1990, let us say, that the internet was a coming thing, had I been the one that had been in charge of the firm, I guarantee you it would not have been a success. Uh, you need the right entrepreneur in the right place as well as having it identified. And that has to be something of a selection process that is not done at all well by the political process. Indeed, it's done very badly by the political process. Politicians, for reasons we all know, all need jobs for their friends and their relatives, and they also do not look at meritocracies with great favor. And uh, I think uh, if I were to say by one main sort of misgiving about the kind of approach uh, that Justin is advocating is that it does give rise to, or it, it is um, a kind of perfection in the technocratic aspects of government uh, that I don't think very often exist, and when they do exist, they exist a little bit 
<clears throat> in some places for a small amount of time. I also worry if you ever get caught up in this kind of process, what happens when you do make a mistake? I know what happens when it's market driven, uh, but I also know that once governments get in there, the reluctance to get out is very strong and pouring good money after bad uh, is very often the order of the day, uh, sometimes in a face saving type way. <clears throat> so I think on the one hand, uh, Justin's work is very thought provoking. I think the argument that governments ought to be supportive is correct, but I am strongly of the view that it has to be the level playing field uh, kind of supportive rather than we will target this set of the other. I also do not know how you identify which industries will go where, and I don't think it's industries like textiles or uh, wooden toys or something. It's much more specific than that, and part of the problem lies there. Even this, let's look at which firms have been successful 20 years ago. Uh, well, somebody might have looked at Denmark, which is after all an eminently successful country, and decided that they should have made wooden construction blocks, because that was after all Denmark's biggest export, by both sides. Um, you don't export toys, you export certain kinds of toys, you don't export textiles or clothing, you export certain items of those. And that really is something for the individual entrepreneur. Let the guy who's wrong pay the price, let the guy who's right get some of the benefits, obviously within a functioning tax system and so on. Uh, but the argument that people sitting at their desks or even moving around the country from their desks uh, in the nation's capital can target better than providing a level playing field, I don't know. Let me just stop by saying that I would agree with Justin with the seven to eight percent growth, except that I think it's probably 10 or 12. Uh, but on the 10 or 12, I think that there are three parts to it. One part is taking away the big mistakes that most governments make that are things that are growth thwarting. And I include in that failures in education, health, and so on and so forth, the whole range of things. The second part, of course, is getting uh, the appropriate framework and incentives, the level playing field. And the, th and the third part is providing the framework, commercial code, and so on, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. My guess is that almost half of that attainable 10 or 12 or whatever it is percent is getting rid of the big mistakes. Now, if you got rid of the big mistakes and did nothing else, you wouldn't do terribly well. There's an interaction term. If you got the, rid of the big mistakes and you got the incentives more or less appropriate, you can get further. If you do all three, you're in great shape. But the number of countries that have done everything right is, I think, exactly zero. Uh, even the countries that have done very well have made mistakes along the way. Uh, one of the tests is whether they can back off quickly when they do make a mistake. And I happen to think that doing so in some of the East Asian countries was one of the reasons for their success. Time is short. I'd love to go out for her, but they won't let me. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, I'd like now to turn to John. Um, John, you've been working on some parts of the world that would be considered lagging regions in terms of development and transformation in Africa and parts of the Middle East. How do you see this on the ground? I mean, do you see any really good examples where this kind of approach has been applied? And um, is there enough guidance on which sectors to support? Anne's raised that question. What do you think the World Bank should advise its clients in this area? Thanks, Alan. I'm not sure whether the geography of the table is, is actually predictive in the sense that as you look, Anne is sitting on my right-hand side and Justin is on my left-hand side. Uh, and I'm going to actually come out somewhere in the middle like the usual two-handed economist. We are the only profession that can put one hand in boiling water, one hand in freezing water, and say I'm the whole uncomfortable. Um, it's a book launch. And I always like in a book launch to try to give you some reasons why I think you should buy the book and then some reasons why I think it shouldn't be the only book you buy. Uh, so let me start from the perspective, as Alan has said, of, of the work that we've been doing on low-income Africa to talk about a few things that are reasons why you definitely should buy the book. Uh, the first one is Justin adds his very powerful voice to a number of scholars who are reasserting the importance of an understanding of structural change in the process of economic development. And if for no other reason to remind us all that the study of economic development is not the mindless repetition of randomized experiments, this is an extraordinarily useful contribution to the profession. But beyond that, it also picks up on and extends a body of knowledge that basically works on the theme of what you make matters. This is important. We're finding this certainly in the case of low-income countries. The work of Danny Roderick and his many colleagues at Harvard reinforces that understanding. And the work that my colleagues and I have been doing at UNU Wider and the African Development Bank continues to give us the very strong sense that one of the key vulnerabilities that Africa faces today is an absence of structural change. 
so this is a very important reminder to the profession and to policy makers in africa that structural change matters and thinking seriously about economic policy to promote structural change matters it also comes at a very relevant time because i think there was a certain amount of pessimism certainly leading up to the period before the great financial crisis that perhaps countries like africa or countries in africa had missed the train simply weren't going to be able to break into the global economy and as justin reminds us in one part of the book changing circumstances in asia rising incomes in asia and a changing global economy are making it possible to think about how countries such as tanzania kenya or ghana might aspire to break into the global marketplace in manufactured goods or in high value added tradable services again i think a very important contribution what he also does, which I think is very important, is to begin to try to bring together two rather divergent schools of thought. Um, as Justin said, much of the debate in 1992 when Nancy and I were engaged in the politics of the East Asian miracle as opposed to the analysis of the East Asian miracle had to do with the strongly held belief systems among different parties. And it was really, if you think about it, very, very difficult to have a reasoned debate among individuals who were convinced that industrial policy was a good thing as opposed to them who thought that it was worthless. I think by bringing together, in a sense, the market-friendly approach, although Justin doesn't use those terms, with a more nuanced approach to industrial policy, he opens up an area for dialogue which is extremely important. Um, and that, I think, is useful, interesting, and well taken. Where I begin to part company, and maybe merge a little bit over with, with Anne, is in a few things that I think are neglected in the work and in terms of how I think about, if you will, industrial policy. So let me start with the things that I think don't emerge perhaps as starkly from the work as, as they might. As I look at the global economy, and certainly from the work that Paul Collier and colleagues and I did with UNIDO in 2009, I think things that are quite different today from when I was learning my trade theory, reading the very elegant work of Anne and Max Corden and others, is that the global economy has changed somewhat. The economic reality, as Justin puts it, has changed. Trade in tasks has become a much imp more important component of international trade. And I think our understanding both empirically and in policy terms of how to deal with trade in tasks is rather thin on the ground. We understand much more about the role of agglomerations today largely thanks to Paul Krugman, Tony Venables, and others, but again, in terms of policy and in terms of analytics, very little in terms of how that actually works. And finally, a new field, Heath Efferman and I were talking about it before the, the meeting today. Economists have now discovered that sometimes people in business schools actually say sensible things. In order to do that, we've had to relabel it. We call them firm capabilities. But the point is that the software of the enterprise not necessarily the hardware of the enterprise, is an extraordinarily important component of competitiveness. And how one acquires and disseminates capabilities are part of that story. So I tend to see the world in terms of these three large drivers of industrial location. And therefore, when I think about industrial policy, what I tend to think of is, shouldn't a government, if it wishes to try to pursue a strategy of breaking into the global market, have a strategy for dealing with these drivers of industrial location? Shouldn't it have a strategy of, if you like, functional interventions that point you in the direction of increasing the probability that you can master trade in tasks, that you can, in some sense, facilitate the creation of industrial agglomerations, and that you can help in the transfer and acquisition of capabilities, all very much, let me underscore as Justin would, in a market-friendly way. You have to work with the market. You can't work against it. So the question would really be, whether or not one can bring together some of the insights that are in the identification and facilitation work that Justin and his colleagues have done, which do tend to look industry by industry with some of these other drivers of industrial location and begin to think a bit more broadly about what an industrial policy might look like. Um, and here let me just mention three possible areas. And I suspect as I do, Anne will probably you know, wrap me sharply in the ribs. The first is, I still believe, ever since 1992, and especially for Africa, that there's a role for an export push. And to quote a phrase that Steve has heard more times than he would like, the point about an export push is it takes a whole of government approach. It's not just the trade minister who creates an export push, it's everybody around the cabinet table. As I look across particularly low-income Africa, 
I don't find anywhere where a government has committed itself in that kind of a meaningful way to an export push. Attracting and building capabilities means you have to have a strategy for attracting foreign investment in the first instance and for opening up value chains in the second place. Those are, again, functional interventions, but they're not very well done, and they could be done better. And finally, in terms of agglomeration, I think Justin and I are exactly on the same wavelength. Why is it the elegant work of Tom Farrell in the World Bank hasn't had any impact in the sense of African leaders holding up their hands and saying, let's get some better advice about how to really create some industrial and export processing zones? So these would be areas where I differ from Justin's work in the sense that I think, as Anne has said, governments should do the things that they can do better. They should continue with an unfinished agenda that they already have, but to the education, public order, and regulation agenda that she would offer, I would offer something of a strategy on industrial development, perhaps built along these lines. Thanks. Thanks, John. Very thoughtful uh, intervention also. Now we come to uh, Steve, who is either on the extreme left or the extreme right, depending on whether you're facing this way or that way. Steve. Just plain old extreme. So as a government official, I'm going to start by intervening in private markets and urge you to buy the book. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, second, just a couple of, of, of quick comments on, uh, first on the, on the need for rethinking and the Washington consensus, and just very quickly. Um, I, 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 pull back a little bit when I hear it's time for rethinking and we're all disappointed in the progress amongst developing countries because we live today at the time of the greatest progress in development in the history of the world and it's not even close in any dimension especially the last 15 years and I'll just give you a couple of numbers uh, that I happen to work on for a different purpose between 1960 and 1995 there were 31 developing countries uh, countries that had incomes below $2,000 in 1960. There were 31 of those countries that achieved a per capita growth rate of 2.2%, which is a benchmark that's the long-term growth rate of the United States. Not stellar, not the 8% that, that Justin wants, but at least it's a pretty good growth rate, 2.2% per capita, so almost 5% uh, GDP growth. There are 31 countries. Since 1995, there are 73 of those. The number of low-income countries as classified by the World Bank, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but it's dropping like a rock from something like close to 70 10 years ago to less than 40 today, something like that. Uh, the poverty numbers that the World Bank released just two weeks ago shows that since 1993, between 1993 and 2008, 15 years, nothing, no time at all, the number of people living under a dollar and a quarter a day has dropped from 1.9 billion to 1.2 billion. It's dropped by a third in 15 years. So we are seeing remarkable progress. So I, I think rethinking is always good. It's always good to rethink, always good to, but it's not like we're living in a broken, completely uh, a, a world full of failures. We're actually living at a time of the greatest failure, of the greatest successes. And it's not, sorry, it's not just China and India either. For the first time, the World Bank numbers are revealing that, that those living in poverty are falling in every single region of the world. So that's one thing. Second, on the Washington consensus, and I always, the failure of the Washington consensus, well, given what I just said, it's not entirely, I, I'd give at least two cheers to the Washington consensus. But part of this is the confusion when people say the failure of the Washington consensus. It's never clear to me whether they're talking about uh, uh, the Washington consensus as it's generally understood, which is market fundamentalism and, and neoliberalism, or whether it's actually what John Williamson wrote about, which is a list of 10 very specific things, which very few people in this room, I think, would argue with the wisdom of John's uh, original list. You might quibble with a few of them. Uh, so I just put that out there that I, it just makes me recoil a little bit when I hear some of this stuff in the broad brush. But. Um, uh, a couple things I want to uh, point out. Th this is obviously a debate about government failures and market failures, as, as we pointed out, and that's right. Government failures, it strikes me, come in two different types. One is when governments do stupid things, I mean, really big interventions and heavy-handed forms of socialism or communism. There are other types of government failures when actually the ideas are not too bad, but their capacity uh, 
to do so is weak. And those are both important failures, but they're very different kinds of failures. And I think here's the, the issue. Stylistically, poorest, the poorest countries in the world have both the greatest market failures, but at the same time, the potential for the greatest government failures, particularly that second dimension of the weakest capacity to intervene effectively. And so that leaves you that the places in the world where you can make the best case on paper for government intervention because of market failures are precisely the places where there is the least capacity to do so effectively. And that doesn't mean you do it or you don't do it, but I think that is exactly the tension uh, of the issue here. And I come at this having worked for many years. I lived in Indonesia for four years, one of the great miracle countries in the early 90s before the crisis. And I spent a lot of time in Liberia as well, one of the countries in the world with the weakest capacity post-war. And I could see a lot of things in Liberia where people had some good ideas of what they might do, but really very, very limited capacity to do well. And even in Indonesia in the early 90s, which was going gangbusters, uh, with much greater capacity and some really talented people, still very limited capacity. And frankly, much of the traditional industrial policy a la Korea, Taiwan, Japan, when Indonesia tried it, it failed, like their national airline, for example, and many others. And it was much more of the export promotion type that worked quite effectively. So I just put a couple of those things uh, out there in these, uh, in these tensions. It seems to me, where I come down on this, it is that it is a mistake for governments to intervene in specific firms, just because I don't think that most governments have the wisdom to do that. And yes, I know you can come up with specific cases in Taiwan and Korea and Japan if you want to make that argument, but very few developing countries are Korea or Taiwan or, or Japan. So it's unconvincing to me, especially having lived in Indonesia and seen it fail. So I don't think that there's much of a case for intervention for specific firms. Uh, but at the same time, I do think that there is a, a role uh, for governments beyond, I, I, I agree with, with all of the lists that, that, that Ann put out, uh, but slightly beyond just the broad countrywide, if you will, environment for private investment. And by countrywide, I mean, you know, infrastructure, schools and education, rule of law, those things all make a lot of sense. The problem is that for many developing countries, that's a 20-year or 30-year enterprise to build infrastructure for the entire country or to upgrade your education system or to uh, get capable judges and get rule of law and uh, property rights and the long list of everything we'd like to see. Even if a government was really committed, it's a, it's a long process. Where I think there has been more success, which John alluded to, is where governments have been active in establishing enclaves where parts of an economy can work more closely actually to market principles. The idea is actually government intervention to make markets work better. Industrial parks are an example of this. Export processing zones are another example. Export processing zones are, are kind of the, the classic example where uh, these are interventions in markets, they don't just spring up by themselves, with an attempt to create an environment where you'll get closer to better functioning markets. You have infrastructure that works, you have a little bit less red tape, you're closer to the port, you might have uh, cleaner customs clearance so you don't have the bureaucracy around it, you have special uh, rules, you have more reliable power, with the idea then that that enclave spreads over time, which I think is actually really closely to what happened in Korea, and that we're seeing, frankly, in China with the spread of the SEZs, literally, uh, uh, away from the coast as they build more infrastructure to connect, uh, to connect roads. And uh, I, I don't see industrial policy writ large as a common denominator over most success stories in developing countries, but I do see various forms of enclaves as being featured in many, if not all, perhaps, but many, if not most, of all of the most successful developing countries that we've seen over the last 20 years, whether it's China or Indonesia or Malaysia or Korea or Mauritius or Tunisia or Poland 
with, uh, with its efforts into, into uh, Europe uh, or Costa Rica or many others. So uh, the idea here is that there is a, a role for governments to create that environment that is not just as we think of it the broad country environment, but actually creating that environment for exports, really, uh, for all the reasons that Justin laid out in his book, and I think everybody here would uh, agree to of the special uh, advantages that come with exports because of the competitive footing that it puts on firms and the technology transfer and, and the encouragement of FDI and all that comes with that. So I think that there's a, a ground here. I hesitate to call it the middle ground because it sounds like a cop-out, and it's not really the middle ground, but it is a different way of thinking of government intervention beyond either uh, you know, the classic kind of industrial policy, firm-specific stuff, but also different from just the countrywide uh, types of, 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 uh, of interventions. We do some of this at, at USAID. We have an instrument called our Development Credit Authority, where it works on the specific idea that there are uh, uh, information failures around credit. And we work, for example, to under, to, with uh, investment, uh, with uh, commercial banks, to, uh, to cover up to 50% of their losses to encourage them to get into uh, broad sectors such as downstream agricultural processing. Not specific firms, but broad uh, sectors where we think there's good reason to believe that there are market failures. So you can get in and go to a bank and say, we would encourage you to get into uh, more lending for downstream agro processing. Focusing on perhaps somewhat different aspects of active intervention, uh, caution against firm-specific interventions, uh, some relating to the environment in which firms are living in, in collaboration <coughs> issues. I think it's interesting that both Anne and John presented a sort of a three-point agenda, uh, starting off with getting rid of uh, big mistakes. Uh, it seems to be an agreement that if you're going to do anything, do it for exports. There's some agreement and some disagreement. Um, we are running a little behind our schedule, and um, I'd like to give a chance to the audience to also be able to participate. So rather than inviting the panel immediately to interact with each other, perhaps we can throw it open for 10 minutes and then give a chance to all of our speakers to respond to anything they hear from the floor and from each other. How about that? Um, Guy, Philip. Uh, two, three. Do I need a mic? Yes, please. Yeah, please keep intervention short yes. if you can. Sure. I'm Guy Pfefferman. I um, founded the Global Business School Network, which I'm running. And uh, I was very pleased to hear three of the speakers talk about capabilities. Um, now, if capabilities are one of the tripod of things that is, are necessary for development, why is there so little attention on the part of aid organizations and governments for capac local capacity building? Uh, Frank Fukuyama claims that it's because um, everybody expects measurable results within 24 months or something like this, and training trainers and so on takes years and years, and uh, the outcomes are, are usually very, very fuzzy. I've been involved for the last three years in trying to find a patron to build a management school in Brazzaville for Central Africa, and these people are desperate. They say, we can't go to WTO, because we have no one who speaks English who can, who's been properly trained, etc. Why is there so little? Thank you, Guy. Um, actually, I could, uh, Joel, just while we're getting ready, um, Guy's question, I would think of it a little differently. I mean, why is there only one African Economic Research Consortium, which has been a great success? Why don't we see it in other areas that are relevant for development in Africa? Joel. Thank you, Alan. I'm Joel Bergsman. I've been messing around in development since I went to work for Hollis Chenery, who was, I think, the first incumbent, probably, of the office that you're in now. Um, John Page, as always, is constructive, polite, and positive. Anne and Steve, who I've never met, are talking about a world that I've lived in for the last 40 or 45 years. And Mr. Lynn, I have to say, I don't recognize the world you're talking about. Uh, about 35 years ago, Guy Pfefferman told me a joke. Uh, it concerned a man in a balloon who was lost and descended to earth and found a man on the ground. And the man in the balloon asked the man on the ground, where am I? 
And the man on the ground says, you're in a balloon, you damn fool. Uh, to which the man in the balloon said, you must be an economist. Well, how did you know, the man on the ground says, because the man in the balloon said, everything you've just told me is true, but it's totally useless. There are no countries on earth that I know of that could benefit from your excellent, excellent advice. Well, as you can see, this is a controversial topic. Uh, <laughs> thank you, please. Um, Mike in the middle. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with this. Uh, yeah. can, can you My question is the point. My name is George Mihaias from Phoenix Partnership. If we admit that the whole world, including developing countries, are engaging in the development of cultural and creative industries, which are more easily available and visible for everyone, more or less. How do you apply your thinking to the development of culture and creative industry? Thank you very much. Um, please. Um, you about um, sorry, uh, Mike, just uh, people can hear you. Thanks, David. Yeah, um, two of the panelists have talked about getting rid of mistakes. If you go back about uh, 30 years to a country like Tanzania, there was a flourishing uh, textile industry. And in the last 30 years or so, maybe 40 years, there's been a process of deindustrialization going on. And that has also been the case in countries like Uganda and Kenya and, and other countries um, in Africa. And um, what I'm wondering is, um, if this process of deindustrialization has already gone on, some of the mistakes have already been uh, put right, if you like. Uh, but at the same time, there's been a loss of skills, there's been a, a loss of externalities, there's been a loss of value chain, core value chain uh, activities. The question now is, uh, if we adopt a more active role, a proactive role from the government, in the case of a, an industry like textiles, which has always been classified as a light industry, one which would presumably come within the, let's say, the next stage of comparative advantage development of most African countries, the question is, what what can now be done? Are we just are we just doing a reset? Are we trying to start all over again the way these countries started 50 years ago? And bearing in mind that many of these countries, we're not just talking about public enterprises; we're talking about Many of them also had private enterprises within, within the textile industry. So what I'm interested to hear a little bit about is what, what in practice has to happen in order to make an industry like this recover or come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Yes, please. Um, microphone. Um, two questions. For uh, Mr. Lin, um, how, uh, I mean, we know that comparative advantages evolve over time. How can we trust that governments change how they pick the winners in, in good time? Uh, second, what do you think of uh, the fact that uh, increasingly in uh, a number of countries, for, for example, Brazil now, uh, industrial policy seems to be associated with increased protection? Is this uh, something that worries you? Uh, what advice would you give them? Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. OK, one more, please. Hi, Simon Winter from TechnoServe. Um, my question is uh, on this capabilities gap uh, issue as well, uh, and uh, many friends in the room uh, who know that um, the biggest task of this challenge, as Steve outlined, is the fact that in the worst of countries, you have these biggest capability gaps that spread right across from the market side to the government side uh, and include other social actors in the process. So what are your thoughts about a dynamic process uh, that allows for those capability gaps to be addressed and, and deliver the kind of smart outcomes that you're talking about? Thank you. I think uh, we have now maybe about 10 minutes, so we should return back to our panel to let them react, and Justin, of course, to uh, things that they've said and things that others have said. 
Why don't we, as a suggestion, start with John? Because there was a question about Tanzania, and John is, after all, the country director for the International Growth Center for Tanzania, and he should know the answer to your question, which is a very good question, I think, for, uh, for this kind of situation. But John, don't be inhibited. Uh, react to anything else that you heard as well. Well, I have a task, and then I have a choice. So let me start yeah, with the task. Task and choice. Um, <laughs> yes, it's true, and it's not just Tanzania. In fact, uh, much of the research and writing that I've been doing over the last three years is to document the extent and alarming uh, nature of the deindustrialization of, of Africa. Um, partly, it is quite simply the shift from a highly protected import substituting environment, a point that Justin makes in his book, to a much more competitive open environment. It's a product of the adjustment period. Now having said that, I might part company a little bit with Steve here in the sense that, and I was giving this advice myself, I think we got it half right. I mean, I think the half that we got right was that the kinds of firms that grew up in Africa in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s under the import substituting regimes were unsustainable. And if they were public enterprises, they were also a drain on the budget. But what most of us believed, and this is a puzzle that my colleagues and I are still trying to work on, is that once you had squeezed the inefficiency out of the system, there would be some residual set of firms that were competitive under the new set of relative prices, and that investment and labor would move into those activities. And here I can only give you two hypotheses, both of which we're trying to work on, just to make a shameless plug, because Alan told me I could make one shameless plug. Um, you and you, Wider, the African Development Bank and the African Growth Initiative at Brookings are engaged in a 12-country comparative project called Learning to Compete. And it's only trying to answer one question. Why is there so little industry in Africa? One of the things that we're doing is trying to understand this process of deindustrialization and what happened. And at least we have two working hypotheses. One is that you ran into a kind of perfect storm. At the same time, you changed the relative prices quite dramatically both governance and, to some extent, macroeconomic policy became so turbulent in Africa that investors were simply not interested in making new investments in those activities which were competitive. The second thing is that if we compare, let's say, the capabilities of firms in Latin America, which underwent a similar sort of radical adjustment, and those in Africa, what you found is that there was enough valuation in the firm, if you will, enough firm-specific human capital that firms could change and adapt, and in Africa that simply didn't happen. One way to think about this, the metaphor I use is, Africa basically rented a building, rented management, and rented technology. And when you stopped paying the rental, it all went away. So the key challenge, I think, and that's why people like Justin and I are so worried about this stuff, is how do you get back into that process? You're quite right. And that would bring me then to my choice, which is to come back to Guy's question on capabilities. And here, because I was asked to say something about the aid business, and I haven't, to point out a couple of things that I think deserve some deep thinking. First of all, I think the reason why both organizations like the World Bank and many of the bilateral aid providers choose to ignore the question of capabilities is much tougher stuff. Um, it's very easy to give people a list of seven things that they should do, call it doing business, spend two and a half million dollars a year to publicize it every year, and fly around the world telling people that's a secret to a dynamic private sector. If you actually have to talk to the private sector, if you have to diagnose what's going on, that's hard work. And that means pe putting people on the ground, and that means doing it well, and that means managing Anne's very strong point about the strong contradiction, the careful path between capture and close coordination. That's tough stuff. I think it's the next generation of issues that the aid industry has to confront. The second one is, in Africa especially, because the aid industry so dominates the debate over public expenditure, think of where the predominant focus of public expenditure has been since the Millennium Development Goals were invented, notably, by the aid industry on primary education. The result has been an alarming skills gap growing between Africa and the rest of the world, which cannot but impinge on the competitiveness of African enterprise. So my first urging to the global community is fix the education MDG. It is not beyond our imagination to come up with a broader measure of human capital. And the second one is get down and do some hard work for the World Bank. And my third one is get rid of doing business. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, let me turn now to Steve. Um, 
Steve, uh, you mentioned capacity as well, and you mentioned some particular areas relating to conglomeration. Uh, any reactions on what you've heard today? Um, just a couple uh, quick things. Um, one, um, uh, in quickly leaned over to me and pointed out some of the failures of, uh, of EPZs, EPZs, which he's right to do. And I just want to underline the point. There is no silver bullet, including EPZs, and they have failed in many places. Uh, they've succeeded in other places, and there's a long debate about why they've succeeded in some places and failed in others. And she's pointed out to me correctly with a note, they're not doing very well in India because they're being used as land grabs. And, and that's correct. I don't think that... The, um, it's different to say that in most countries that have succeeded in promoting labor-intensive manufactured exports, they've used some kind of enclave, which I think is true, which is not the same as saying every time these enclaves have been attempted, they've worked really well. Uh, and that's a longer conversation, but I wanted to just uh, to, to make that, that, that nuance. On, on your point about, uh, about capabilities, uh, Frank Fukuyama has a lot of it right. Um, in terms of the issue that uh, of the incentives and the pressures that are faced with the uh, aid business of achieving uh, results in a, in a pretty tight time frame. In many ways, that's a very good impulse to push aid agencies more towards achieving results because we have been too lax, I think, for too many years of not uh, of not thinking about uh, results in a, uh, in, a, in a clear way. But one of the downsides, uh, and there are several, but one of the downsides is that you tend to move away from things that take a long time to see those results, both a long time and indirect, if you will. Um, uh, and it pushes us more towards things where you can see specific outcomes very quickly, uh, the number of people on antiretrovirals or the number of bed nets distributed and fairly quickly thereafter some impact on, on, uh, on malaria uh, and, and those kinds of things, which are also, by the way, quite important. That's not to, to, to undermine those things. But it does pose a particular challenge for education and for capability building. And I think that that is um, made doubly difficult by the, the history, um, now a bit long in the past, but still with ramifications, of a lot of investments in higher education in developing countries that were seen as failures because the system uh, was used uh, to essentially educate the elite. And when money went into higher education systems, you know, the old stories of it was the richest families and, and the best connected families that, uh, uh, that uh, were able to take advantage of that, um, and there wasn't sufficient investment in primary education. And I think we're still seeing the ramifications of that uh, and only just in the last few years have people begun to move back from a focus almost exclusively on primary education to even secondary or vocational, not to mention even uh, uh, higher education. So we're a little bit uh, uh, stuck in that. Um, and I certainly see that uh, where we are at USAID of, 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 of the pressures both from that long legacy and uh, to immediately see quick results. Um, so, uh, so I think that's important to see. And then on the, I just wanted to reiterate John's point on the, on, the, on the textiles issue in Tanzania. And I think it is kind of the perfect storm of the things he mentioned of, of that it was a largely import substitution. There weren't the market tests. And the, the other element, of course, was just as those industries were beginning to collapse and the countries in Africa were seeing the huge macro problem, were just when the Asian countries were emerging, so there became, there was, a lot of other, suddenly there were a lot of other choices of, for firms to invest if they were making textiles or shoes that didn't, that weren't there in the 60s and even the early 70s. But by the late 70s or early 80s, all of a sudden there were lots of, lots more places where they could invest. And so it's one other element that I think led to that, uh, that, uh, uh, that kind of undermining. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to get it back, but we're beginning, to, I think, to see some progress in some countries. Um, uh, in terms of moving up that chain, perhaps not in textiles, uh, but in more labor-intensive things, especially agro-processing and other things where we're beginning to see, I think, uh, some more growth uh, in, in some African countries. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, Anne, you've heard a variety of suggestions from our panelists, some perhaps more nuanced than others. Uh, any reactions? Lots of 
Uh, uh, any, any, any brief reactions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, first John says, yes, structural change matters. I certainly agree. But I think there's a real question as to whether how much of the change that matters for the good is the outcome of things and how much is something that you can, doesn't matter how you do it. And I fear uh, that some of this discussion, uh, perfectly intelligent and so on, but it will be seized upon in exactly the wrong way. Uh, so the people will take this as a license to go back to the bad old ways. Uh, I know of nothing any better about subsidizing individual export firms or industries that I do about subsidizing or protecting import competing. I think it's equally undesirable. And I fear uh, that some of this is giving license to exactly the kinds of things that were mistakes before uh, in a new guise. And I, I think in India one can document their first, quote, export promotion strategy. They ended actually up with negative exports in the sense that many goods were exported where the import content of the exports exceeded the value of the export. I'm sure it's true in Brazil and other places too. And there's as much danger from this kind of thing when we see it as the, you know, when we want something we want the change because it's productive. We don't want the change for its own sake. Uh, that, in turn, means that it has to come about uh, through reasonably efficient means. I want to tell a little story. I was lucky enough to be asked by the Koreans to do their study of, I've, I've forgotten how many years, in the 1990s, 50 years of trade, no, 1980s, I guess, of their first 25 years of trade and growth, which was the period when they they had changed strategies and all that. And I said, okay, but I want to talk, among other things, to some of the businessmen who were there in the 1950s, because they were the ones <coughs> in the import substitution. Um, I could tell lots of stories about this, but I'll just tell the big one, the one that tells it all. I got to see the man who had been the biggest, most richest businessman in Korea in the 1950s. He had had a virtual monopoly on cement and, other, and many other building materials. Uh, he was in a 12-story office building. I took the elevator to his very nice office on the top floor. And he says, see all these buildings that we're looking around? Of course, they're all skyscrapers around. See all these buildings around me? They weren't here. I was in the tallest office building in Seoul in the 1950s. That was number one. Number two, I asked him, how much did you learn from the cement industries and building materials that you could use after change? Oh, they were exporting by this time. Nothing. We threw all that out. That was junk. That had nothing to do with what we're doing now. And over and over again, I've heard that story. After the, in Turkey, I've heard the same thing. That even when you saw some of the same people, the equipment had been trashed. They'd often gone to a new location, all kinds of other things. I have real questions as to how much of the alleged learning is really learning of a kind that's valuable uh, in terms of going into uh, much more productive economic activity. I don't know, but I, I, I'm a skeptic, as you can tell. Uh, and I guess the last point I would make uh, would be that, you know, sort of, Yes, it's a 20 to 30 year process to upgrade education, but you get the benefits of some of it long before that. It's not a zero, one variable, it's a continuum. And the same on all these other things. And I fear that moving away from these because that all, not all of the payoff is immediately there is a real uh, problem in the longer term. Uh, I think these things do have payoffs. Uh, certainly they don't all come in the first year. They are cumulative and they are also multiplicative across reforms. And it's a mistake, I think. Uh, to think simply, well, we'll get this one completely done. I have no doubt in my mind that you could do wonders with any number of, I can think about 10 laws in India, any one of which you change would make commercial policy, uh, commercial law work better. If you changed all 10, it would be a miracle, but it would do wonders, uh, because the interaction between all of these things uh, gets to be very important in these circumstances. Uh, as I said, there's lots more, uh, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Anne. Um, Justin, you have the last word. We uh, do want a break for refreshments. I'm sure you could uh, you could respond for a very long time to these, but give us your quick reactions to these thoughts. You've heard a number of questions, and uh, uh, some of them are political economy in nature, and how you do things, and the incentives to do them wrong. Okay, I think you know all these questions and comments are very relevant and I give an opportunity to clarify some of my ideas and position. Regarding Anne, you know, I heard her comments, but I'd like to say most of her comments still based on the industrial policy of the old structuralist. That's one thing. And secondly, his thought about the possibility of identification, most of the examples are high income country. <laughs> and I will say, how come high income countries should not be irrelevant? You know, and I'd like to say that as long as resources is limited, then privatization 
choice is unavoidable. For example, an agree in a low-income country to bring agricultural technologies to have extension would be desirable. But you still need to ask what kind of crops you want to improve technologies and which areas of farmers you want to bring the you know, extensions. And what are the mining constraints? It's irrigation or chemical fertilizers or access to markets. And all those things you need to choose. You need to choose. You need to pick. So I'd like to say, you know, to identify the task, identify the sectors, and bring in those kind of necessary improvement. It's part of the nature. And this is not only in the low-income country. In high-income country, again, the same. For example, we know, like the US, then they need to do a lot of new technological innovation and, uh, and R&D and so on. And the government can play a role in a basic research. And so you have a NSF. But NSF also need to choose what kind of direction of technology that the country like to go. I don't think that NSF chooses the project randomly without any criteria. As long as they have criteria, they have some kind of technology, some kind of direction for the country to go, they are picking winners. So I would like to say, picking winners is the daily life, as long as the resources are limited. And secondly, I mentioned several times about it's so hard to identify the right industries, like in the US, like in Denmark. And I'm specific about that. However, we know that like the US and Denmark are the high income country. Currently, their technology and their industries are only global frontiers. And so under that kind of situation, certainly, which will be next hit will be harder to understand. And the failure will be much larger. But we are talking about the development process, especially for a low income country, middle income country. In this process of industrial upgrading diversification, there are something called the latecomer advantages. Because you can always learn from the country they are successful and they are ahead of them. And they are going to you know, lose competitive advantage in certain sectors. Those can be in the guidance. So we should not give up those kind of useful information for the developing country to design their policies. And a third thing that Anne is thoughtful about the desirability of industrial policy because we observe a lot of developing countries continue to do the wrong thing as in the old structuralist. But they continue to do the wrong thing is because we do not provide the right thing for them to consider as a references. And, uh, and uh, so that's the very reason, that is the reason why we need to improve our research and to provide a much better framework and uh, to give them have a good references so they can avoid doing things wrong, right? For example, in the framework of gross identification of facilitation, what the framework that John proposed. In effect, subsidy is not necessary. It's basically a facilitation. As I mentioned, if you want to be competitive, two criteria. The factor of cost of production should be the lowest. And that basically depends on your competitive advantages. But secondly, your transaction costs also need to be the lowest possible. And, and, and that we heard related to the infrastructure agglomeration and so on. And those are the areas where the government need to do. And most of those kind of activities does not provide direct subsidy to the firm. It's just a facilitation and a, a little bit you know, compensation incentive for the first mover. Then I agree with John about those three areas focus. In effect, that's all included in my gross identification and facilitation, although I do not use that term. And then coming to the steep, you know, I say that uh, Washington consensus, you know, actually performed much better. But it depends on how you calculate it, right? If you look from 1960 to 1980s, those are the periods that most countries, you know, were influenced by the structuralism. And then from 1980s to 19, 2000, those are the periods that country influenced by the Washington consensus. If you divide the period in these two, you find actually the gross performance for most countries declined. 
And uh, when you do 1960 65, we know 65 a country, you know, after the Washington Consensus reform, they collapsed to the bottom. They started to recover. That's one thing. And uh, secondly, after 2004, there was a global boom, resources boom, because of dynamic growth in a number of large emerging markets. And that created the demand for the resources and increased the resources prices and so on. So among those 33 countries, I am sure a lot of them are resources visited country. They benefit from the growth of boom and also because of recovery from the collapse. And, and agree with you, some other area, for those I agree, I do not, I'm not going to mention. Then coming to whether this kind of advice based on a new structure of economics will be treated, will, are relevant. And I would like to say it's relevant. And the government take them very seriously. For example, recently we have a study about Ethiopia. And we identify four sectors. There's a shoemaking, garment, and, 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 and agribusiness. And we carefully carry out the value chain analysis and find that they have competitive advantage in those kind of areas in terms of their effective cost of production because they are very, very intensive. But their transaction cost is too high. And as long as the government remove those kind of transaction cost related barriers, they can be competitive. They can create, you know, a million jobs. And with this kind of analysis, the government immediately wanted to implement that. So I do see if research and the government see the value, they will take that seriously. Well, I have some other questions, but uh, you only give me <laughs> time is out. So maybe we can continue our discussion at the, uh, 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 at the reception.